yes. I was watching the uh, oh yes. Uh, the video lecture that you record, uh -huh. and I realized yeah, we are right under the there. microphone, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can hear me. I'm like, oh man, yeah, that's not good. Sure, right. That is incriminating, <laughs> is what that is. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if everyone hears me. Okay, so our technique in this section is to separate the variables. So we're going to put one differential on the right, one on the left, and then group the corresponding letters. So this one is going to turn into a dy over y equals 4t cubed plus 1 times dt. So that now has the variables separated. And then we integrate both sides. And we end up with natural log of the absolute value of y on the left. <clears throat> and we can just put one c. We don't have to put a plus c on both sides. We can just put the plus c on the right-hand side. So then t to the fourth plus t uh, plus c. <clears throat> So now we have the answer in implicit form. We don't have it in explicit form. This one is very easy to put in explicit form. Explicit is when we solve for y. We don't have the y buried inside of another function. So let's go ahead and solve this for y. There's one really... Uh, subtle step here that you'll see with a lot of differential equations that end up with a log. So let's go ahead through this carefully. So we're going to exponentiate both sides. And when we exponentiate both sides, we end up with that. And here is the subtle step. Subtle step. Prepare yourself for subtle step. There is the subtle step. Because why? Because, because you're why? multiplying it by e to the c, which is just an arbitrary constant. So let's take a look at something slightly simpler. Let's just suppose we had e to the c plus e to the t plus c. You could write this as e to the c. You could write this as e to the t times e to the c. E to the C is just another constant, and so you can pull that to the front. So that's a common technique that you'll see when you have the constant of integration up in the exponent. They'll pull it down as a coefficient constant. So these C's are clearly, they're different, but regardless, it's just a constant. And now we're going to do one more thing. We can. This step's not as subtle, but we can then get rid of the absolute value bars also. Because this is going to equal plus the right-hand side or minus the right-hand side. That's just a constant times the right-hand side. So we can think of this C as absorbing that plus or minus. So this would be our simplified explicit form. So that's explicit because we've solved for y. This is the general solution, and we will then find a particular solution with the initial values given. So that's the general solution. And now we're going to find our particular solution. So to find a particular solution, you have to have some initial value given. Some books you'll see this referred to as a boundary value. It's just some ordered pair that's on the solution curve. 0, 4 is on the curve. So let's go ahead and find our particular solution. When we plug in 0 for t, we need to get 4 for y. So we're going to have 4 for y when we plug in 0 for t. So what does that tell us that c is equal to? 4 is y equals c e to the 0, right? So that tells us that c is 4. 
So therefore, the particular solution, the solution that has this point on it, is going to be 4e to the t to the fourth plus t. Oh, I did this wrong. That will be our particular solution. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions? So we just plug in that initial value, solve for C, and then back substitute it. Let's do another one. And it's pretty important to rewrite your Y prime as in differential form so that you can separate your variables. So I'll always start out by doing that, just rewrite it so that it's in differential form. Prime notation doesn't work so well when you're trying to separate differentials. So this one ends up with a dy divided by y times y plus 1, and that's going to equal dt over t. Integrate both sides. And to integrate the left side, we're going to use partial fraction decomposition. And this one is a great candidate for the convenient value method. So PFD, partial fraction decomposition. So we're going to separate this fraction into two fractions, two partial fractions. And because both factors in the denominator are linear, this is a very easy one to do with the convenient value method. So first we're going to multiply by the common, well, by the denominator on the left. End up with that. Is it not useful to distribute the y? Because I immediately did that. Yeah, not useful to distribute the y here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you wouldn't want to do that. Because you have to multiply it by this side, and if it's distributed, then it's not obvious how to cancel with the denominators on the right. So you wouldn't want to distribute. Leave it as factored. And what would be our first convenient value? Zero or negative one. So zero and negative one, those are our two values. When you plug in zero across the board here, when y is zero, this term goes away. This ends up being one equals a. So done. Plug in negative 1, this term goes away, and we get negative b equals 1. Negative, we get negative b equals 1, so b is equal to negative 1. So those are our two values for a and b. And now we're good to go over here. This is going to be the integral of 1 divided by y minus the integral of 1 divided by y plus 1 dy. This side we can go ahead and integrate. We get natural log absolute t plus c. Oh, don't t's, not y's. Y's on the left, t's on the right. So we're going straight down. So when we integrate this side, we'll have y's. So this will be natural log absolute y minus natural log absolute y plus 1 equals natural log absolute t plus c. <clears throat> Once again, this is a solution that's in implicit form. Sometimes you cannot write an answer in explicit form. We'll have a couple in a minute that we can't write explicitly. We can't pull the y out. Here we can. We'll be able to isolate the y. To do this, we're going to use a log property. Log property first. And then we will exponentiate both sides. So then we'll have absolute y over y plus 1 equals e to the natural log absolute t plus c. Then we're going to do this thing. We have a plus in the exponent position. 
So we can treat it as e to the natural log of absolute t multiplied by e to the c. e to the c is just another constant that then can come to the front. So this will be written as c times, and what about e to the natural log of absolute t? It's just t. It's just going to be absolute t. And so it's just ct. Both of those absolute values create plus or minus ones, so we can just slip them into the constant also. So we can get rid of the absolute value bars. Those will just be a constant multiplier. Now we multiply both sides by the denominator. We'll have ct times y plus ct. Trying to isolate the y. We're almost there. We almost have our y isolated. Subtract. So we, we get this. Now we can do what with the y? Factor it out. Yeah. We're going to factor that y out to the front and then divide by the other factor. So let's cut to the chase. 1 minus ct. This is the general solution in explicit form. So general solution. So general just means that you haven't plugged in and found C. So it's general. Yeah? Never mind. Sorry. Okay. Yeah? Uh, shouldn't you have the different constant added to that as well? Uh, we have our constant of integration when we integrate right here. Right, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be also added in the final answer? No. So it's added here, but then it turns into multiplication because e to the c is a constant. Right. So the constant's not the same all the way through. All right, so this c could be different than that c, could be different than that c. Right. It's just that you're multiplying by a constant or dividing by a constant or adding a constant. So the plate. The, so what matters is that when you plug in your initial value, you can plug it in wherever you want. You could plug it into any of these lines. If you plug it in here, you're going to find a different constant, but then you're going to, you know, then reduce this. We'll try to simplify it all the way down to something that looks like this, where we have y solved for, right? And then we'll plug it in. So this is a general solution in explicit form. And now we'll find our particular solution. And the particular solution, one is equal to we have, what was it? y of 3 is 1. So y of 3 is equal to 1. So we're going to have 1 equals 3c over 1 minus 3c. And so now we have to solve for c. Figure out what C is. We're going to multiply. We have 1 minus 3C equals 3C. So 6 equals 1. So C is equal to 1 over 6. Therefore, therefore, our particular solution is Y equals, we're going to replace this C with 1 over 6 in both places. And to clear that fraction, I'll multiply top and bottom by 6. So we'll end up with, we'll do it one step at a time. Make sure it's clear. So 1 over 6 times t, and this will just simplify to, t e to y equals t over 6 minus t. So that will be our particular solution given that initial value. When you have a general solution with more than one C, will all the C's be the same? Unless you have a, have a differential equation that was second order, okay. then you'd right. have two C's that were different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this case, we have a first order differential equation, so we should end up with just a single constant. All right. <coughs> Any other questions on that? So let's go to this one, and 
they're telling us in this case that we have to that they want us to just leave our solution in ex, uh, implicit form. So let's talk. Let's figure out what the heck that means exactly. So we're going to multiply both sides by y squared minus one. We'll multiply both sides by dt. So now the variables are separated. Y is left, T is right. We integrate. We get y cubed over 3 minus y equals 2 thirds T cubed plus C. We're going to find, so this is a general solution in explicit form. Excuse me, general solution in implicit form. General solution. Just skip ahead to the integration, right? And this is implicit form. Yeah, to go from. You were just like, I'm just going to go straight to yeah, the we'll, integration. Yeah, we can just put an in integral yeah, symbol yeah, right there. there. Whatever you want, dude. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever, yeah, man. Yeah, Sounds good. Oh, good. Integral right there. Sounds good. <clears throat> so general solution, Sounds implicit good. form. Uh, now this is one where we can't solve for y, so we are not going to be able to find an explicit solution. That we cannot solve for y. But we still can find a particular solution in implicit form. So y of 0 is 0. So if y of 0 is 0, we're going to plug in 0 and get 0. So 0 for y. We're plugging in 0 for t. So, so this tells us that c is 0. So therefore, our particular solution It's going to be exactly that without the C. So we cannot solve for Y here, but what I want to do is look at this graphically so that you kind of get a sense. If we were to graph, maybe I'll write it up here so I can put it into the... Uh, and one thing we could also do is multiply by 3. If we multiply by 3, we at least clear the fractions. So that's probably a slightly nicer looking answer. Not necessary, but it is a reasonable step. All right, so let's graph this thing. Y cubed, I'm sure I put a capital Y. Y cubed divided by minus 3y three. Three <coughs> equals 2t cubed. Oh, wait, did Oh, and this doesn't have a T in it, I have to put an X. Whoa. <laughs> All right, so there is the solution. That's the solution curve. And let's go ahead and grab that and bring it over. And let's analyze what this means. So there is our solution curve. Now, do you see that this curve is really really has three implicit functions? Is that obvious to you? Oh, yeah. Three implicit functions. Sure. Yeah, I saw that right away. <laughs> I totally know what you're talking about. Right? It's definitely not a function overall because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. So if we look at this, there are three implicit functions to this curve. There is a function right here. That's a function. You exclude those vertical tangents. This is a function. <laughs> Why does it do that? I don't want it to do that. And then down here, there's a function. So we have three possible functions. So somehow, we would have to indicate which, which one of those three restricted functions is the solution. We look at our initial value y of 0 is 0. That tells us that 0 comma 0 is on the curve. So that means that this yellow piece, that is our solution right in there. That piece right there, that is the solution curve that we're choosing. How do you state that? Uh, we're in a graph, we would just point it out um, <coughs> that we're just choosing the solution that has 0 comma 0 on it. Okay. 
So when you do a typical antiderivative, you know how you get an infinite number of parallel curves, and then if you have some initial value, it just picks the right one. Right, so you pick one of the infinite number. With this type of scenario, we're just picking one part of the curve. So we just, we're imagining that as the solution curve right there. So that is the function that satisfies that differential equation. And so then if we were to choose a different part, will we change the constant to yep. make it a line zero? The, uh, yeah, so if we wanted one of the other two, we would need a value from one of those two curves, and then the constant would change. Okay. Yep. Okay, so one more of these. We'll write it first in differential form. And then we'll separate the variables. Not too hard here. So the y's are going to come to the left. Once the variables are separated, integrate each side separately. And on the left, it looks like we can't integrate directly. We'll have to use u sub, it looks like. So if we let u be 2 plus y squared, du will be 2y dy. So du over 2 will be y dy. So y dy will be replaced with du over 2. So this gets She just moved the one half out to the lower left. The one half gets moved out. Yes. So we're going to have one half integral of u squared du. And then on this side, we'll get x squared divided by 2. The 2's cancel, and that's where we'll put our c. Then we're going to go back and plug in our 2 plus y squared. And I'm going to multiply both sides by 6 just to clear the fraction. So I'll just leave that c as c. Again, it's like a recycle bin. If we multiply a constant by 6, it's still just a constant. These two constants are clearly different, but that doesn't matter because we're only going to care about the very last statement. That will be the c that we use. So this is a general solution in implicit form. And because the square is on the y, it's an, uh, an even power, we, we're not going to be able to peel this apart and solve for y. Now we could, well, if we did, we'd get a plus or minus, which is not an explicit form. It's still implicit because it's y equals plus or minus. It's not explicit. So that's our implicit solution. We could do the same thing with the graph and figure out which one we want. We want the one that has that initial value. So y of one, y of one is negative one. So y of one is negative one. So we're gonna get two plus one cubed equals six plus c. Three cubed is 27, 27 minus six is 21, so C will be 21. And therefore, henceforth, henceforth <laughs> our particular solution <laughs> shall be, shall be, shall be this, God, love. shall be that. There's our particular solution. So that is the solution that satisfies the initial value. It doesn't matter which side you put the C on, right? Cool. Not if it's in, ex in uh, this implicit form. In explicit form, it's always going to go on the right, because you're going to solve for Y. But in, in implicit form, it doesn't matter.
So the three dots that just get my last solution. Uh, yeah, the three dots that that mathematically that stands for therefore. Oh. That's just a math shorthand for therefore. Do you know about the upside down therefore? The upside down dots? What does that one mean? Because no, it's a gmail. Oh, is that because? <laughs> so upside down dots. Whoops. I upside down dots. Ads. I don't think I, I don't remember that. So that's because? Yeah. Hmm. boy Hmm. Did not know that. At least I don't. Because I forgot it and haven't recalled it yet. I, I use the three dots all the time in physics. I'm like, this equation. I thought it was a tattoo thing. All right, look at that. Yeah, I thought it meant you did something bad. I thought the last one That's why I got one. This is our last one, and then we'll go review this one. We have that. You guys do it. Go for it. You now have the skill. Is that really your email? You now have the ability to do this. Looked weird at first. Because this, because no, it is true, or he is true, but you basically just flip it now. So they might just turn it right now. Oh, what's going on? Speed. Yeah. Now you have A is true because B is true. We're plugging in a 1 for x and a negative 1 for x. Basically, instead of putting an error, that's why we plug in the negative 1 to little. Uh, because it's square, <laughs> it almost looks like we would have been So if y had an odd power, it would come out of different right. <coughs> Plus or minus. Plus or minus. Yeah, it's looking good. Um, when you integrate, you should have a division by 2, but did you have a minus by that? Oh, I was OK, yeah. It's coming. So. Yeah. It's on its way. So we're going to integrate. Uh, is that, did you plug in for your C yet? Oh, not yet. OK. Yeah. Your C will be non-zero. What? Yeah, this will be good. Integrate both sides. Oh, OK. <laughs> yep. So that, that's going to pull the y's to the left. Oh, this is a plus. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay. That'll goof it up. That's why you say, what are you talking about? I solved this super quick, but then I solved this super quick. Wait, where'd the exponential come from? Try again. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no exponentials. So when we, in this case, we can just cross multiply. And when we integrate, we will get y squared over 2 equals minus x squared over 2 plus c. That's what I got. Now, if you want, you can multiply both sides by 2 and add the x squared to the left. And you can just think of that c again like a recycle bin. 2 times c is just a c. Looks like a circle. Oh, you did that. And then y of 0 is 1. So to, to get our initial value plugged in, it's going to look like this. So when x is 0, y is 1. So c is 1. So therefore, our solution, therefore, x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. I did y squared is equal to negative x squared plus Hold 1. Is that can cool? you? Yeah. You can't take the square root of um, the constant, because I, I kept did you take multiplied by 2, right? Um, so that I got y squared circle. equals negative x squared plus c, and I took the square root of both sides. Yeah, you wouldn't want to do that. But then it's not. Why? Because then you're then, then you're breaking it apart into y equals plus or minus, so that you're creating a piecewise defined okay. function. Then you don't want to do that. Well, yeah, you don't want plus as a you don't want plus or minus. Well, if you do it with a minus, it will become imaginary, so there will only be, only be one solution anyway. No, it'd be negative x inside parentheses because squared, which would be positive. It's going to be one equals negative uh, square root of c minus one. So let me look at yours in a second. So this tells us that our solution is a unit circle. Because 
if I square the whole thing? And we want to pick, so this is a, a curve that's not a function. So our particular solution will be one of the two functions that's embedded within that circle. And we have to just decide which part is it. Is it the top half or the bottom half? X is zero, Y is one. So this is our solution right there. That's our solution curve. So if we wanted to write our particular solution, we could choose because now we know that it's the top half. So now we can take the square root and say that it is this. We know for sure that it's not of the minus part. But that's only after we plug in our initial value that we know. So that would be our particular solution right there. Oh, so you actually do want to... So this is general solution. Uh, uh, this, is the, this is the particular solution in implicit form. This is our, so particular and implicit form, and this is an explicit form. So let's think about the other one that we had up here where we had that weird squiggle. We couldn't isolate and change the equation for that squiggle one. You know what I'm saying? Right, for here, there's no way for us to, re that we can't just pull out from here and say, ooh, this piece of the equation just gives us the yellow part of the curve. Here we have no alternative. We have to just leave it in implicit form. The one that we just did, we have the luxury, when it's an implicit form and we see that, oh, it's gonna be the top half, this form is simple enough that we can actually go all the way down to an explicit form, even though up here we can't solve for y uniquely. And so it depends on the equation. In this case, we come up with a circle, and we can extract the equation for just the top half. With that other one, we have no way to extract the equation for just this yellow part. So it's because the curve happens to be a circle and we can extract just the top half equation, we can do it. So Daniel? So if it happened to be y of 0 equals negative 1, then it would have been y equals negative square root of 1. Plus yes, exactly. So then a, the curve would be the lower half of that circle. Mm -hmm. So is there a, like a general strategy for picking the solution? that we need, or do we just need to notice something about the function like we did with this? Sort of yeah, it would be really about noticing. And if you have a nice teacher, your teacher will say, find the explicit form or something, <laughs> so that you have a clue. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the end of 9-3. <laughs> so now we get to spend the rest of the time reviewing, probably mostly chapter 8, unless you have questions from 9-1. Let's do it. Did anyone have a 9 1 question that we want to talk about? Is this going to be on the test? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, on the test, will you be that nice teacher who says what? Yes. Who <laughs> <laughs> says what? That says find the explicit solution, oh. find the implicit solution. So, I'll tell you so that you have a clue, you're not Absolutely. trying to guess. Should I be able to get the explicit solution from this or not? So, you'll know. Cool means. Um, for the, the practice test. Mm hmm. You said you guys didn't teach 9193 in there before? Is this like brand new semesters? this semester? Uh, it was brand new last semester. They just so there is problems like again. this on the practice? Yeah, test. yes, yes. There I haven't looked at it yet. Yes. No math teaches, though, great at integrating stuff. Integrating stuff. So should we go to chapter 8? I'm going to go wash my face. Take it from the top. Chapter 8, let's right? take it from the top, chapter 8. So that is chapter eight. Okay, so the practice in my math, so you have two places to go. In my math lab, there's a practice assignment for chapter eight, there's a practice assignment for chapter nine. And then in D2L, there's the old exam that you should also look at. So both those things you should look at. Cover all bases. Is this just in my math lab right now? This one is my math lab. 
So there is number one. We'll just talk about each one, and if you want to go through all the details, we'll do it. So we have 5x plus 2 to the negative 8. So you can use u sub or reverse chain rule. Mm -hmm. I like reverse yeah, chain rule. Reverse chain rule. Does anybody want to see this one written out? Huh? Yes. So. What's wrong by looking at? Okay, so this one is a one stepper. So this will be 5x plus 2. We add 1 to the exponent, making it negative 7. 7. Thank you. Divided by negative 7. And then divide by 5 and a plus c. So we could write this as negative 35 down here or put it as a negative 135th out in front, it doesn't matter. Excuse me. And if you're, I won't ask you to write it without negative exponents, but if you wanted to, you could of course pull that down into the denominator. Oh. You can make it like a negative one over 35 times the seventh root five x plus two. Yes, uh, one over the seventh root. I think I said that. Seventh root? It's not a fractional power. There's no root in there. Oh, wait, just what? Did, did I miss? Did I uh, just nod? Are you? Oh, yeah, there's no, sorry, there's no root. Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry. You're, not, you're right, that's my bad. Yeah, that's one bad. over 5x plus 2 to the seventh. Seventh power, not, yeah. Yeah, seventh power, not seventh root. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to remember that next time you all say something like that. I say the things wrong every single time. So do you, uh, did you take the 5 off the 5x and times it by 7? So we divided by the 5 from the derivative of the inside, so that's where the 5 came from, and then we multiplied it by the 7. Okay. Yeah. So Okay, how about this one? So this has a negative exponent on one of those powers of E, and the book calls it subtle substitution. So on the test, I'm going to say that just because that's what the book says, even though I think it's a really silly <laughs> description of what we're about to do. But that's what the book calls it. Question. That's what the book calls it. The book calls it subtle substitution. So I'll write that on there just because the book does it, even though um, it doesn't make that much sense. So what is our goal with that negative exponent? Good question. Hold on one second. Okay. Somebody was just about to say something. Or not. OK, yeah. What's your question? Why is my? Uh, review matching yours. Do you know why? <laughs> well, I like, printed out the ch the eight nine review thing that we're doing, but they just don't match up. Oh, really? Completely. Of type of problem or just numbers? Just the numbers. So are we on eight point one right now? Point four five? Yes. That mine are just different. Huh. That's weird. Math lab does that. Yeah, it has an algorithm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're algorithmically generated. You're not going to have the exact same problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. This is um, Now I understand what you're saying. Thing on my math level. Thank oh, you. Okay. Now I understand what you're saying. Yeah. All right, that's fine. Yeah, the yours aren't going to look identical. Right. It'd be cool if you did. Okay, so negative exponent here. We need to clear the negative exponent. What do we multiply top and bottom by? Plus 3e to, e to the negative 4x. Mm, well, just the first part of what you said, because we'll distribute that. e to the 4x gets multiplied by everything. So our goal is to eliminate that negative exponent oh, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we multiply everything by e to the 4x, that will work. So all terms are going to be multiplied by that. So we'll just have to distribute that in the denominator. So in the numerator. We'll have e to the 8x. And in the denominator, we'll have e to the 8x minus 3. e to the minus 4x times e to the positive 4x is e to the 0. e to the 0 is 1, so we are left with just the 3. Oh, smart. And. What technique or what form is this 
integrand in? Log, Log form. Oh, wow, there's such a cool example. The derivative of the denominator is e to the 8x times 8. So I'm going to put an 8 there and a 1 8 there. Now it's perfect. So we get 1 8 times the natural log of the absolute value of the denominator. Plus C. And that will be our. Oh, that's, a big box. that's not the box I was looking for. All right, so that's our answer. Natural log. Can I go wash my hands? <coughs> you know where to find us. All right, so that's, I think we can fit one more on here. So let's jump back. Any questions on that one? Uh, can you take just Two second peek at mine real quick. Two seconds? <laughs> Since mine was just a little bit different. Oh, yeah, sure. But my answer would be correct. There. So you're going to multiply top and bottom by e to the 8x. So you have e to the 16x. That looks good. That looks good. Multiply by 16. Divide by 16. Yeah, perfect. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. You're good. Sweet. So, number three. Evaluate that integral. Hmm. Uh, you want to do the complete square? Well, I don't know. Let's see. Yeah, I think it's totally good one. So what do you guys think? Complete the square? So we have a trinomial in the bottom. And with a trinomial that's not factorable, then that's a candidate. We could use completing the square. If it was factorable, we would factor it and maybe go to PFD, partial fraction decomposition. If there was no middle term here, we would probably go with trig sub. But because it's a trinomial, we're going to try to complete the square. So that means that we need to have, we need to separate this 122 so that the first three terms form a perfect square trinomial. And what constant needs to be right here on the end of this trinomial so that it's a perfect square trinomial? One plus one. 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 We plus divide by one two one. and square. So we need a plus one. So we're going to peel one off of that 122 and be left with the 121. Is it a good idea to try to complete the square when the v term isn't divisible by two? Ideally, you won't have a B term that's not divisible by 2. If you do, then you're going to be dealing with fractions, which we're about to do a trig sub, which would be a real pain in the neck if there was also a fraction on top of it, so I wouldn't do that to you. So, but if it was a trinomial, you, that's the best way to go, so you would have to deal with fractions in. So if it's odd, it prob like it's probably not a question where I have to do completely the square. <laughs> That's a reasonable <laughs> assumption. That's a reasonable assumption. Exactly. If it's odd, probably another technique. So we have that. This is 11? This is actually. Do we actually need to use trig sub here or. No. It's, just it's just arctan. Exactly. So we're going to factor out the 121. And when we factor out the 121, we're going to have it in arctan form. So it's arctan form says that the integral of 1 over 11 arctan of x minus 1 over 11 plus c. <coughs> so there's our arctan form. So all we have to do is arctan with a little reverse chain rule. So we've written it as dx over quantity squared plus 1, u squared plus 1. So this is going to be 1 over 121. I'm going to leave space for the reverse chain rule. Reverse chain rule is going to give us a multiplicative factor. Multiplicative. And that factor is? 
and then one over eleven. So the derivative of the inside is one eleven. So we divide by one eleven, which means multiply by eleven. And that will cancel with the denominator. Well, part of it will. Say that again. Arctan. Oh, Arctan. Thank you. Arctan. Yes. Arctan. Arctangent. Good? Totes. Totes? Totes. All right. Let's go check out another one. Ultraviolet voodoo? Totally. Yes, sir. Ultraviolet voodoo. <laughs> so the key is picking the right U and DV. So think to yourself what you want to pick. So a couple of the options in your mind, there's really only two main options. You have 8x in one and e to the 5x in the other. And if you think about the 8x, if you put that with the u and you differentiate, you're going to be losing a power on x, which is a good thing. If you put the 8x with the dv and integrate it, you'd be increasing the power on x, which is going to make it more complicated. So we definitely are going to say u is equal to 8x and dv is equal to the exponential part. Differentiate u. Integrate v. Integrate to get v. Integral of an exponential is itself divided by the derivative of the exponent. Reverse chain rule. So we end up with uv minus the integral of v du. So that's going to be 8 fifths e to the 5x. Move your 8 fifths out to the left, maybe. Whoop, we can pull that out, and we can do it all in one step here. Yeah, so we'll have 8, eight over 25 e to the 5x. Minus 8 25 e to the 5x. Plus If you have a question, I'll just, yeah. So for the problems on the test, are you going to tell us which integration method to use for all of them? I will, in general, tell you what integration technique to use. Every once in a while, I won't. But in general, I will so you don't <coughs> spend time trying something that's oh, thank not goodness. productive. <laughs> Okay, let's take a look at another one. So this one is ultraviolet voodoo, but we've got a trig function and an exponential, and what we'll see is that this is one of the twist problems. Should we do one with a twist? Integration by parts with a twist. Ultra twisty. Ultra twisty. Ultra Wait, are we doing uh, voodoo for this as well? Yep. All right. Because it's a product. The primary function of integration by parts is that it allows us to integrate products that we could not formally have integrated. So we have a product here, so we, that is a clue that we want to use integration by parts. And so on this one, you can essentially use either one, right? Yep. What do you want to use? Honestly, I want to do you as the cosine. All right, so we'll use u as cosine. And we're going to let dv be the exponential. 
So with these products with uh, cosine or sine and e to the x, doesn't matter which way you go. You'll have to do it twice. You just have to be consistent. Do it the same way when you integrate your second time. So we're going to differentiate cosine to get minus sine, and then multiply by 6. Integrate to get 1 seventh e to the 7 x. So I'm going to call this integral here, the whole thing, let's just call it capital omega. And so we have omega equals uv. So that's 1 seventh e to the 7x times cosine of 6x minus the integral of v du. So minus a minus is plus. And then we're going to have 6 sevenths sine 6x times e to the 7x. I'll write it as e to the 7x times sine of 6x. So uv minus integral of v to u. Integration by parts a second time. Let's be consistent, so we're going to let u be the trig part. So u will be sine of 6x, and dv will be 6 sevenths e to the 7x dx. Derivative and integral. So we have this part out in front is just coming along. And then we do another uv minus integral v du. So u times v is 6 49ths times e to the 7x times sine of 6x. So there's uv minus the integral of v du. So that's the bottom row. Are we going to be going in circles? You have to do the 36. With a twist. We're going to twist it up. Twist. Twist. So we can e twist this. 7x cosine of 6x dx. So now what we notice is that we have an omega on the left. That's what this whole thing is equal to. And right here, this part is just a multiple of omega. This is minus 36 divided by 49 times omega. Because omega is the integral of e to the 7x cosine 6x. So now we want to add this like term to the left so that we can combine the two omega terms. So on the left, we have 49 over 49 times omega, and then we add that. So we're going to have 49 over 49 omega plus 36 over 49 omega. That's all going to equal this stuff, 1 7th e to the 7x cosine 6x plus 6 49ths e to the 7x sine 6x. And then we're going to put our integration constant here from this integral. There's the integration constant. We combine 
our two omegas, so we get 85 over 49. So omega will equal, so this is 85 over 49. We're going to multiply by the reciprocal. So 49 over 85 multiplied to both sides. 49 in the top, 85 in the bottom. So that's going to be le that's going to give us 7 divided by what did I say it was 85? 85. Thank you. 7 divided by 85 e to the 7x cosine 6x plus so should be divided by 49. That's supposed to be a 49 right there. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Not a 46. So now we're going to take this 49 on top is going to cancel with the 49 on bottom. And we're going to have 6 divided by 85. 6 divided by 85 times e to the 7x times sine of 6x plus c. Integration by parts with a twist. So. Do we have a second to just explain that once we arrive at the twist part? Mm -hmm. So, because my equation was a little bit different, mm -hmm. a little different from an iteration. Um, so I got down to my second part mm -hmm. where I have my big uh, whatever. Yep, um, where you have your like terms. Uh, yeah. Right. You, so you have your like terms, so now you just have to combine those like terms. So that's always the tricky part. So this integral here, you just have to remember that the coefficient is really just a coefficient of the original integral. So the original integral is out on the far right when you add it to the left. So I got down to like here. Here's my second integral after doing doo doo twice. So then you're going to add five fourths to both sides. So, five so do I have this guy multiplying into here into here? Uh, yes, you do. Yeah. That's so why I, I never. That that's why I don't factor that out. Oh, you don't factor it out. So I will put that into there. Yeah. So that will have to be distributed. So instead of five fourths, you're going to have twenty five sixteen. I'm going to have five over sixteen e to blah, and then I'm going to have five over sixteen. <laughs> This. And then where's the twist coming? So the twist is when we add that to this side. So we take that and twist it over from the right to the left. Okay. Last time I asked you if you did ten I don't need to explain this. But what about when it was the Do you want to use tabular integration? Yeah, I do. Can you take that back to the same place where you started? So now we can find some. I mean, when you get good tabular integration. Yeah, so here I am after that. And it works for this if you know how much. This? You get lost in the negative. Yep, but you can do it. Not a problem. Not a problem. Down here, you're gonna have All right, why don't we take, uh, is that ohms? <laughs> yes, large omega does represent ohms also, but not in this, in this case. So let's take our 10 minute break and then we'll so finish up chapter eight. Oh, yep. All right, let's go ahead and start it up again. Do we want to do a volume? Yes. Oh. So. Excited to do a volume. Let's do a volume. Just all of it. All Again? Again. <laughs> okay, so find the volume of the solid generated when the given region is rotated about the line x equals natural log of 8. Who's a Renee Swindle? She's really good. Yes, she's great at Cal 2. She's awesome. Wonderful. She's the bomb. <laughs> okay, so e to the negative x, that's exponential decay at zero, we're at one. Call that one. And we're going to zip down to about there. That's where we're going to say natural log of e. Oh no, this is. Oh yeah. And then the axis of rotation is also natural log of 8. So we're going to rotate about this. It's probably dumb, but is the the zero to the natural log is that what is it called? The bounds? 
Is it always going to be on the axis that's being rotated? Um, so, like, how do you know if it's on the y-axis or x-axis? Well, this, so when we give a function, we always give the interval based on x, based, the, on, based on the independent variable. Okay. So when we say the function is f of x equals e to the negative x on this interval, that means x comes from that interval. Cool. So that's how we know it's from the x-axis. Yeah? On the test, are we going to get a picture of the graph? or? For e to the negative x, no. Well, yeah, not that one. But if it's like a crazier one. Yeah, if it's crazier, yes. Okay. E to the negative x, you should all be able to graph. Right? Um, <laughs> e to the negative x, e to the negative x, down to the right, e to the positive x, up to the right. Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay, and we're going to rotate. We're, this is a rotation horizontally. We are going to. Does, does it tell us what technique to use? No. No. On the test, I will tell you what technique to use. But here, it makes most sense to use a cylindrical shell. Is it clear that using washers doesn't make sense? Yes. Yes. Because then we'd have to use a compound region and it would be a lot more work than necessary. So there's the height, that's the vertical element at x. And we know that the area of a cylindrical shell is 2 pi times r times h. So we then need to replace the r and the h with functions. And what will R be? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, good. I, I don't think I heard one wrong answer. Did you, you say natural log of 8 minus x, right? Yeah. I didn't say anything. Yeah, I didn't ask you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so the. Uh, the radius is right there. That's a horizontal distance. So we want to look at the right curve and then subtract off the left curve. So the right curve is over here. It's the vertical line, natural log of h. The left curve is the line x. So it's natural log of 8 minus x. That will be our radius. And then how about our height? Yeah, just the function. So that's just e to the negative x. Good. E to the negative x. So you just did a. Uh, you did ln x minus ln eight minus x. Right minus left. Whenever we have a horizontal distance, it's always right minus left. That's right, because we're not revolving around the. Uh, yes, we're revolving around this thing. I see. Yeah. Right. Yeah, if we were rotating about the y-axis, then the radius would just be x. Yeah, that's right. Mr. Voss? Yes? Um, I've always been confused on how to figure out. What if it was like on the left side of the y-axis? That we're rotating about? Is it still right minus left? Or is it left it's or still right minus left. left. So if we have this right here, and we're rotating about, say, negative 2? Yeah. So then our radius is right there. This is at x. So this would be area of shell ugh, will be 2 pi times r. r will be x minus minus 2. And then h will still be the function. OK. That makes sense? Yeah. So it's still right minus left. The one mistake that is often made is that this minus somehow doesn't get used. So it's x minus minus 2. So you get x plus 2, not okay. x minus 2. You can even think of it this way. x is measuring that distance. This distance is 2, so the total distance is x plus 2. Yeah. All right, good. Good. OK, so then we have our volume. Volume is equal to 2 pi times the integral of that. And when we integrate that, we will distribute so that we have natural log of 8 multiplied by e to the negative x minus uh, x to the negative x. <laughs> yes. 
Zero to natural log of H. Did you say natural log of H? Eight. I heard H too. Eight. <laughs> natural log of eight. It's a long day. All right, so I'm going to stop it there. This part in front, that's just a direct integration, divide by negative 1. What do you use to integrate x e to the negative x? No. Voodoo. Use a little voodoo yeah. integration by parts one time. Wait, so for the first part, though, how would you integrate That's a constant. Or not a constant, it's a number. Which is constant, it it's a constant. But it's e to the negative. So, so it would be this. The integral of an exponential is itself so divided by the derivative of the exponent. Uh, natural log of 8 just floats around. And then this will be 0 to natural log of 8. Uh, and then that's yeah, And then this integral of x e to the x. This part you'll use integration by parts. We already did that one earlier. Cool. You found volume. We did. We found volume. Is there enough space to do one more? Yeah, let's get a new page for the next one. Okay, so next on the list, powers of sines and cosines. I think we probably should do at least set up a couple of these, even if they seem really easy. Okay, so powers of sine and cosine. We have two options uh, in general. One is if the power is odd, and one is if the power is even. So if the power is odd, that's the simplest case. If either of the powers on sine or cosine is odd, simplest case. Pull one off, convert the leftovers. So here, the power on sine is not odd. It's a fraction, so it doesn't even fit any question about it being odd. This is odd, so we can pull one off and convert the others, convert the leftovers. So this will be integral 9 sine to the negative 3 halves x cosine squared, which is 1 minus sine squared, and then cosine x dx. So we pull one cosine off, convert the cosine squared to the other function. Now we are going to use u sub. So we're going to let u equal sine of x. So du will be cosine of x dx. So the whole idea of putting cosine out, pulling one cosine off, is that that's going to then be the derivative of the function that we let u equal. And then it becomes pretty cool. So this will be 9 u to the minus 3 halves times 1 minus u squared du. And that's easily integrable once we distribute. So we're going to have 9u to the minus 3 halves minus 9u to the 1 half du. Why are you keeping that 9 in there? So I don't feel like writing parentheses at this point, because I know that... Why don't you pull it out in the very first step? Yeah, we could pull it out in the very first step, okay. but then we're gonna, we have it split anyway. There's going to be multiplication, but when we add one to each of those, we're going to get different multipliers, so then we'd have to have a nine all the way out in front. Okay. It doesn't matter. You can pull it out. Either way will work. So then let's just go through this. So we're going to get, we add one, so we get negative one half. We divide by negative 1 half. And then here we get minus 9u to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves plus c. So we're going to get nine, minus 18. We plug that back in. So we're going to get minus 18 over the square root of sine x. 
minus 18 over 3, which is 6, sine the 3 halves of x, which you could write as sine square root of sine if you wanted. Dennis? Um, so to be clear, I think we talked about this. Uh, it's not an arc sign. It's basically a cosecant. Yes, okay. it's right. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. As soon as they put in a number other than minus one, we have to assume it's a two power. But most books would not do this. Most books, if they wanted a power that was negative, they would write parentheses around the sine x and put the negative three halves on the outside. Right. So. It See, if it, if it was an arc sign, that would separate it. Yeah, okay. that's what most books would do. Okay. So here we know that they don't mean that. But it's a little funny the way they write it. So we could get a common denominator if we wanted, but this is fine. We can just leave it like that. You could write this as sine x times the square root of sine x, but you can just leave it like that. That's fine. You could leave this as sine to the negative 1 half preferably on the outside, but. So the piece about if you did factor that nine out, the part that gets a little funny is, usually you only factor a number all the way to the front if it is a common factor of everything. And so because there's the plus C in there, it's, it's funny to have nine parentheses and then on the outside plus C. Well, I kind of just so. did it in the integral, and then eventually after it's all of that multiplied it back. Yeah, that's totally fine. That will work. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Okay, powers of tan and secant, those are the hard ones. Those are a lot harder than sines and cosines, usually. Mm -hmm. Now we've done so many of them. So, do we not need to do one more? No, we should, well, do, we should always do, do more. We this should always thing. do more. Always do more. When you're trying to decide whether you should be doing homework or not, you should always do more. Okay, so with tans and secants, the two cases, tan, but maybe it's helpful to actually write down the derivative of secant and tangent over here so you kind of know where we're targeting. But it's good if secant is to an even power or tangent is to an odd power. We know that the derivative of tan is secant squared. And we know that the derivative of secant is secant tangent. So the idea is if we have an even power of secant, we can pull two off for the differential and convert the others. That's not going to work if we have an odd power of secant. If we have an odd power of secant, we pull two off, then we're left with secant to the 1. And we don't have a way to turn secant to the 1 into tangents conveniently. Because we know that secant squared is equal to tan squared plus 1. But we can't then take a square root, so we can't do that. So this only works if secant has an even power. So even power on secant. So even power on secant, we pull two off, and then we're gonna, our goal is to let u equal, is to turn everything into tangents. So we're gonna let u be tangent. Down here, this is the case where we have tangent to an odd power. So tangent has an odd power. So if tangent has an odd power, we pull one off with a secant, because the derivative of secant is secant tangent. But the main point is that if tangent is an odd power, we can pull one of these off. And then we have an even power left, which we can easily convert to secants, because tan squared is secant squared minus 1. So here, we have an even power on secant. So we're going to pull two off and convert the leftovers. So we pull two off and convert the leftovers. So two come over to the differential. So that tells us that we're going to let u be tangent, because then du will be right there, secant squared dx. Now we convert the leftovers. So we pull two off. We have two left. We know that secant squared is equal to tan squared plus 1. Again. 
again, use that triangle that is so helpful to remember this identity. That triangle right there. Very helpful triangle. Okay, so now we're ready for u sub. If u is tangent, then it all comes out nicely. So u is tangent, du is secant squared. So this will become 8 u to the half multiplied by u squared plus 1 du. Factor the 8 out, you can leave it in, doesn't matter. 8u to the 5 halves plus 8u to the half du. So we will get 8u to the 7 halves times 2 sevenths plus 8 u to the 3 halves times 2 thirds plus c. Yeah? How, how are you using the triangle here? Uh, for the identity. Oh, okay, just to, okay. I see. Yeah, if you don't have them memorized yet, that's the triangle that's super helpful to just yeah, see yeah. visually that secant squared is tan squared plus 1. Yeah, okay. That's or that tan squared is secant squared minus 1. Yeah. Okay. It's the visual for, the, for that identity, if you don't have it down already. Hopefully you do. Hopefully. And then we had let u be tangent, so this is going to be tan. And uh, let's just write it like he writes it. So 7 halves x uh, plus 16 thirds tangent to 3 halves x plus c. I think it's like one equivalent, right? So the yeah. two good yeah. cases, even, secant, odd, um, tangent. Those are the two good, good cases. cases. Yeah. <laughs> Any step on there you want to talk about? We haven't even gotten to that. Actually, I understand. Which yeah. one do we do? That was 8.4. No, that's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. I thought you were No, no, no. I'm just saying, like, in the review that we've done yeah, so yeah. far, thus far. All right. Let's go take a peek at what's next on that list. OK. So we, do you want to do this one? So this one has an odd power in tan and an even power in secant, so you could do it either way. It's not going to matter. Is there like can a... Can you show us the... So you're saying, is this the one where you, um, you pull one off tan and then it becomes seek tan? I mean, you can do it that way. Or or that's the one easier. that I don't really get. Can we All right. this yeah, one let's, well, yeah, let's at least set it up. We don't need to go through the whole entire thing, but let's set it up. So... Okay, so tan has an odd power, so we need to pull off a seek tan. You could also do the secant way, but you're asking to do it the other way, so we, we can set it up both ways, actually, pretty easily. So if I'm pulling off a seek tan, I'm going to be left with tan to the fourth, secant to the third, times secant tangent dx. So there is the differential. So we know that our goal is to let u be secant. That's our goal. Because derivative of secant is secant. So we want to have just secants over here. So that means we need to convert the tan to the fourth. So that is going to happen because we know that tan squared is sec squared minus 1. And then that's going to be squared because we have to the fourth power. And then we have our secant cubed, and then our differential, which will be sec tan dx. That part will all be the differential. 
So now we're going to let u be secant. du will be secant times tangent. And we've got it. So 29, we can pull it to the front. We're going to have u squared minus 1 quantity squared times u to the 3 du. And then it always becomes a polynomial. So we always use the power rule and then back substitute to get to our trig function again. So we'd yeah, square I, that out. I think out. I was taking, like by putting the secant in there, I wasn't taking the power off of secant. So right, so, so you had an extra power of secant. Stupid though. thing. It could give you a headache. So the other possibility here, we'd pull off secant squared and turn the secant squared that's left, turn that into tan squared plus <laughs> 1. You could do it that way also. So this one could go either way. All right, so let's go peek at the next one. All right, trig sub. Should we do that one or? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's a secant. Let's do it. Okay, so. This is a good one for a couple reasons. One, the following mistake is really easy to make. So the way we've been doing these is to factor out, because what we would like is to have a difference or sum of squares with a one, with a leading or trailing one. Here we would want to have a trailing one. And I'm going to rewrite the denominator a little bit differently just so that I can emphasize what we should be doing here. So we're going to be, there's no 256 over here with the x squared. So we're going to be thinking about multiplying top and bottom by 256. Most of you are at to the point where you probably don't have to do that, but let's just do it. And we'll come up here. <coughs> so. We're going to factor out this 256. This 256 there and that one are being pulled out. So they're going to come to the front of the integral in the denominator. To the three halves. And there needs to be a power of 3 halves on there. This is the common mistake, not putting that power of 3 halves on there. And let's make sure everybody sees crystal clear why that is. And what's the square root of 256? 16. 16, yeah, thank you. Um, to the three halves. Okay. Is everybody crystal clear on why that 256 pops out as a three halves with a three halves power? Um, that three halves power there. <laughs> that was terrible explanation. So right here, when you're looking at this, if we're super careful here. We're factoring 256 to the front down here, and then we have x squared over 256 minus 1, parentheses, 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 3 halves. So this 3 halves has to go to both this and it has to go to the 256. All right, that 256 is still within the 3 halves power. So that 3 halves affects the 256 when it comes out. So it's going to have a 3 halves power when it comes out. Okay, so then on the outside, square root of 256 is 16. So we're going to have 16 cubed. And let's do our let statement over here on the side. So we have difference of squares with a trailing 1. That's going to be secant squared minus 1. That's what our target is. If we have secant squared minus 1, that's would all collapse into a, just a tangent squared. And that's what our goal is. Our bigger goal is to take this difference or sum of squares and combine it into a single function. So that means we're going to let x divided by 16 be secant of theta. 
So then we're going to have 1 16th dx equals secant tangent d theta. So then when we substitute here, we'll have integral dx is going to be 16 secant tangent times d theta. Leave it down here where we have a little bit more space. Any questions there? So we just replaced the dx. And then down below, secant squared minus 1 is tangent squared. Tangent squared to the 3 halves is tangent cubed. So that'll be our full substitution. <laughs> cancel a tangent, cancel a 16. not one of the nice cases where secant is even or tangent is odd. So that means we'd have to, we have to do something else. Put it back to secs. Back to, well, if we convert this to secs, then we've taken the denominator and turned it into two terms. And if the denominator is two terms, we can't split anything. So if we had a tan squared in the numerator, I would say definitely a super possible Nicholas? Sines and, Sines and cosines are cosines probably going to be the best way to go. So do you see that if we turn that back, that that makes it more complicated because then the denominator is two terms and we have no way to split that apart? If the numerator is two terms, we can split fractions. But if the denominator is two terms, that's not helpful. So what we're going to do is, yeah, let's go to sines and cosines and see if that is going to do the trick. Okay, so we have 1 over 256 integral. So these are sine, sines over cosines here, so we're going to get cosines over sines, but one of the secants is going to cancel, so we're going to get cosine over sine squared. So everyone agree with that? Now we're perfect. We can just let u equal sine. All right, u can be sine. So du will be cosine theta d theta. So 1 over 256, integral of u to the negative 2 du. So 1 over 256. Add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, so we get u to the negative 1 divided by negative 1 plus c will be minus 1 over 256 multiplied by 1 over u. 1 over sine is cosecant of theta plus c. <coughs> then go back to x's. Go all the way back to x's. So we have to go back to our original substitution. Secant is x over 16. So we'll draw a triangle. Oops. So secant, what did I say secant was? x over 16. x over 16. So then this side will be the square root of x squared minus 256. And we're almost there. When we look at that triangle that relates x and theta, we need so to hard. figure out cosecant of theta. Cosecant is going to be hypotenuse over opposite. Yeah. So then we're there. Okay. So 
So go secant is opposite, so hypotenuse over opposite. So it looks like there's no cancellation. So negative x over negative x over 256 times the square root of x squared minus 256 plus c. All the way back to the x's. Nice. I had a lot of stuff in it. Comprehensive. Very comprehensive. Any step you want to take a peek at? Hey, is, are you going to post this? Oh, you're going to have this posted then, right? Mm -hmm. That's the answers for all this stuff here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you show the first substitution? Mm hmm. Uh, we integrated once, but we did two substitutions. Right. So we substituted with the trig, and we got down to a place here where we had to use regular u sub to actually eliminate the integral. So we did two different substitutions, but one integral. Okay. The first, the first substitution is what kind? Trig sub. Trig sub. So the trig sub turns this difference of squares into just a single function. Right, okay. So the trig sub compresses and takes a difference or a sum of squares and compresses it into one function. Oh, and then you just, okay, you, then you just. Uh, and then we converted the sines and cosines. Okay. You and we realized, the power lost. Okay. say again. I think I just lost the power of three halves, so that's what made it look old. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, so that three halves right here. This is tan oh, squared, and we get two times three halves, which is three. Right. Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at the next one. Anyway, I'll take that. Yep. Last one. Is there a time we're converting into like sines and cosines? Sometimes, if you convert to sines and cosines, it has the same difficulty to it. So it's either going to be easier, or it's going to be about the same difficulty. It's rare. I can't think of an example where it would get worse. So just so when we have even power on secant and odd power on tangent, just always convert into sine. If we have an even power on secant or an odd power on tangent, we can do it directly. But if we have the opposite of that, so if we have an even power on tangent, odd power on secant, then converting is a good good job. Mr. Bus. Yeah. You have to simplify. So if you like go back to that one you were just on. Because I was I was doing a similar one but with like different numbers. Yep. What does it become? Oh, never mind. That one's like lots of words more strings. But like. Yours was more complicated. Yeah. So like at the end, um, I kind of had like. Do I have to simplify this down, or would I be able to leave that on the test like that? Uh, you would want to get rid of fraction of fraction. You don't want a fraction in a fraction. Okay, so I would have to. So you'd have to do something. Oh you'd have to do one more step. Because it's the same thing as that. I just. Yes. Yeah. That. That would be. Okay. Yeah. So you don't want a fraction in a fraction. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Can you explain how you chose secant again, just for the first example? Yes. So when we're looking. So we, there's only three choices with integration by trig sub. And our goal is to take the sum or difference of squares and turn it into a single function. So what we know is that secant squared of theta minus 1 is tangent squared. We know that 1 minus tangent squared is secant squared. And we know that 1 plus tangent squared, excuse me, we know that 1 plus uh, sine squared is cosine squared. I, that's not true. No. What's the other one? Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Oh, this is the wrong one. Right there. It's 1 plus. And you can get all of them by just dividing the original by sine, sine squared or cosine squared, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So these are the three that we use. So if we have a difference of squares with a trailing one, then we want to use secant because secant squared minus 1 will compress that into one function. If we have a difference of squares with a leading one, 
we want to use sine because 1 minus sine squared compresses into a single function. And then if we have a sum of squares, we want to use tangent because 1 plus tan squared compresses to a single function. Yeah, those are the three, the three options. The three possibilities. And that is new, right? We did not do this one. Okay, so how about this one? Yeah, one minus What trig sub would this one be? Sine, secant, or tangent? Sine, secant, or tangent? Sine. The minor one. Sine because we have a difference of squares with a leading one. So this would be a sign. So we're going to need to remember that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on your the, goal. The one minus this, the yeah. one minus the you want to be top the sign. 10% or bottom yeah, 10%? So What's your goal? I want to be the 1%. <laughs> Which 1%? There's two of them. The bottom. Like the <laughs> I want the one I'm the 99%. I want to be the middle 1.02%. The one out of 5,000. The one out of 5,000. 1,500 on your SAT, what's that? Top 2%, right? Did you get 1,500 on your SAT? I don't know what the SAT is. I never took an SAT. Well, sorry, SAT is a test. For the young ones. Well, I took an ACT. Yeah, a lot of they switched it. It tests my class graduated. So we'll just write the setup here, and unless somebody wants to go all of Okay, so that's the setup. Is there any question on why that is the setup? Is that totally obvious? What's it's the wrong. square root of 144? It looks good. 12. I understand. No. It makes sense? Yeah. Yes, it 12 is 12. 12. Square root of 144 is 12. Whatever, man. I don't need this. I don't need this. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was there. Everybody okay with that? <laughs> So let's go look at the next one. All right, so here we have a sum of squares. Let's do the same thing. Let's just set it up. This is the easiest one because you don't have to remember which direction the subtraction is. So that one's the easy one because it's tangent. Sum of squares is tangent. All right, so here we would rewrite this. We'd factor out 36 in the bottom, in a square root, so it's going to come out as a 1 sixth. And then we have x squared, x, and that's going to be square root 1 that is plus. Yeah. <laughs> that look good? Not so good in <laughs> Jim, I'm going to cut out early and do a close my restaurant tonight, so. What restaurant? I'm at Village Tavern. Oh, yeah. You've been there? I've been there. It's pretty good stuff. Not for a while, but. Which one? Is there more than there's one only, Village Tavern? There's only know. one Village Tavern in Colorado. I'm not from Colorado. I don't know if there's more. From Col in Colorado, I don't travel to one. Westminster, so I don't know if there's one here. There's one in Greens. The only one I know is in the Flatiron Crossing. Oh, With sick. Salem. There's a bunch of things. I was like, maybe there's another one. It could be. Wait, why so it's like village I thought you were going to ask a math question. <laughs> why? Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Um, is there a way to visualize this as like a triangle? Yeah. Since it's a tangent here, so x, or no, that's y divided by 6, so would that be your x? Right, so it's x is a vertical, 6 is a horizontal. So, <laughs> so when we let, when we go to do our substitution, x is going to be 6 tan theta, so that'll be a 36 tan squared multiplied by dx, which will be secant squared times 6. See it? Yeah. Alright, let's go look at the next one. Okay. Oh, that More crazy. complicated. And it's definite integral. Oh. Definite integrals. Definitely more complicated. Definitely. Definitely. Does it feel, doesn't it feel like you do all this like pure calculus 
to like get the and result with a plus C, and then you just like, yeah, here's some numbers. Let's just put those. Let's in there. just throw them in just to make sure. So crass. So pedestrian. Yeah. It's unsophisticated. Unsophisticated. We're both. All right, so we, like the abstract. we will attempt this lowbrow problem. <laughs> can we pull the seven out right now? <laughs> so funny. You can pull the seven out. Jim's cold. Whatever floats your boat. I like that. Wherever you want your seven. Immediately. You can pull it out right away. Does not matter. Don't even write it the way you do. I just immediately write seven and then integral. OK, so we have a trinomial in the bottom. It's not factorable, so we're going to use the method of completing the square. Oh, that's what it is. I don't know the words. Completing the square. Oh, is it factorable? Oh, it is! Minus 11. No. No, minus 11 and 9. Oh. All right, let's do it that way then. Darn. It is factorable. So completing the square is half the middle. Right. Half the middle yeah. squared. Yeah. Half the middle squared. But here we can uh, use PFD. Yes. And we can use PFD with the convenient value method. Because those are linear. So PFD with convenient values. Have fun at the tavern. Wow. Drop by. The tap. Oh, yep, this stuff. Wonderful. PFD. <laughs> PFD, multiply both sides by the denominator. And this is the simplest case of PFD because we do have linear factors. So we can use the convenient value method. So if we let y equal negative 9, we are going to have 7 equals negative 20b. So b will equal negative 7 twentieths. Should have taken out the 7. <laughs> you could have pulled out the 7. Can't we still pull it out right now? Whenever you want. So plug in an 11, we're going to get 0 there and 20a. So we're going to get a equals 7 over 20. So that will give us the integral from 0 to 6, I think that is. So 7 over 20. Divided by y minus 11 minus 7 over 20 divided by y plus 9. And pretty straightforward. Both are logs. So we're going to get 7 over 20 natural log y minus 11 minus 7 over 20. Natural log, y plus 9, 0 to 6. Wait, what? Something's wrong. Or is everything just trying? Something is desperately wrong. What is it too easy? Well, if we plug in a 6, we get a negative number in there. But it's the absolute value. Ah, thank you. <laughs> I did that same thing. Thank and you. Renee Swindle was the one that told me. She's like, but what's that absolute value? Oh my gosh. That's why I was like, what's I was so panicked. <laughs> so panicked. I thought maybe there was another thing that it's I'm just to panic every now and then. It's good to panic every once in a while. It totally it's reminds me of this so ridiculous <laughs> Scrabble game. <laughs> I beg your pardon, sir? It reminded me of this ridiculous moment playing Scrabble uh, where I was playing with my friend's dad uh -huh. and we were playing with, the few, there's four of us and my friend plays once, O-N-C-E. My friend's dad looks at that 
slams his fist on the table and says, what the hell's an aunt's? That's the word, I challenge you. It's like, an aunt's? No way. You're kidding me. How do you not see that that's once? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> every so often I'll look at a word once and be like, does this word make sense? It doesn't make sense. My mathematical brain is like, this doesn't sound right, but it is right. But it is right. In seventh grade, oh my gosh. Okay, so you could do log properties there. Whatever. I would. You don't have to do log properties though. I, would. I don't like that. Yeah. If you're her, don't try log properties. You might lose points. <laughs> I like this. You literally you just put the division sign. Yeah. A division? It was added. I've seen you do log properties just fine. Don't shell, sell yourself short. I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm saying I would do it. <laughs> OK, so this guy here, let's make sure that we can set this up right. All right. What technique here? We have a cubic in the denominator. If we were to multiply it all out, but it's factored for us, we're going to use PFDs. So write down your PFD thing, your, your uh, fractions. I want to make sure that you do this one right, because this one has a classic pitfall. Is it multiplying x squared? You just write it down. It's right down. I don't want because there's a problem that sometimes crops up that I want to make sure you don't make on the test. The only one that might make it now is Keegan. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see if he does this. Go. <laughs> That's the only part I'm really, the, the main place where somebody might make a mistake is right in the beginning. I've already heard the mistake. Isn't that, you said it's So square. this is what it should look like. Yes, you did it right. Okay, so why isn't that BX plus C? Because it's So not the two candidates linear. are linear or irreducible quadratic. This is really x minus 0 squared. Oh, I see. So it's a linear factor. What if you turn see, it into I was going to do it the right way, and then I overcome it. I just showed it to you. I know. That's Say that again if you turned it into x times x. Yeah. Yeah, or x times x. Yeah. So yeah. then, you would have, then you could just have three factors. Right. right, you could do that. The main thing that you want to not do is put an ax plus b over x squared. You put so a over x squared, b over x. That's totally fine. So you'll get the same Yeah, thing. you'll get the same answer because you'll get your b, I'll get my b, and they'll be different, but my b will be your a, and your a will be my b. I've been wondering this for a while, <laughs> yes. but could you consider zero as an imaginary number? No. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> you can. Can we combine all of those? You yes. can consider it. <laughs> Okay, so multiply both sides by the denominator, and we'll have this expansion. I don't think we need to go any further, but you tell me. Wait. That's the answer isn't right there. It, isn't it C? <laughs> ETC. Wait, isn't there another X multiplied by C? I don't see any other X's multiplied by C. When this gets multiplied over, just the x plus 3 cancels, so we're left with an x squared. Correct? I, I did it. I multiplied by the, the other stuff. Oh, the other stuff, yeah. Don't All multiply. of that multiplied so, each one. Yeah, you're only multiplying by the denominator on the left. Okay. So do we want to go further or not? Are you okay with that? I think we're good. Yep. Can Max? the b be over x still? Um... Oh, is that what you're going to say, Nicholas? Oh. So you're saying that there's a x missing here? Yeah. Okay. So when we multiply by x squared, x plus 3, by each of these, okay. doesn't the x squared cancel? Okay, yeah, that's true. Do you see it? So each term is getting multiplied by x squared times x plus 3. So that's being multiplied to each of these. 
So when it multiplies by the middle, the x squareds cancel, and we just have the x plus 3. And then over here, it cancels out the whole denominator. And what was your question, Nicholas? Well, could we finish this by not using the convenient values method? Yes. Since, we Since you, we've done that so many times now. So here we're going to distribute, and the idea is that we're going to write the right-hand side as a polynomial. So we're going to write it as a polynomial, and then we're going to use the concept that polynomials are equal if and only if their coefficients match. It's the only way to have two polynomials that are equal. Their coefficients of corresponding powers have to match. So on the left, we have 0x squared plus 1x minus 33. So we have a quadratic on both sides. Over here, the coefficient of x squared has to match that coefficient of x squared. The coefficient of x has to match the coefficient of x. And the constant has to match the constant. Shouldn't that 3a have to 3x? Well, let's see. From up there. Right here? Yeah. That should be a 3ax. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So let me just change those pieces there. So that should be a 3a times x. So that and that are like terms. So it's 3a plus b times x. And then that's the only constant term then? OK, yeah. That matches. Thank you for seeing that. And then that. So what we're, gra we're grabbing the like terms up here. So those ones, these ones, and then the constant. There's just the one constant. Okay, so that gives us a system. And 99% of the time, these systems will be really easy to solve with substitution or elimination. Let's take a look at the system that we get. So the system will be a plus c is 0. And then 3a plus b is 1. And, ooh, 3b equals negative 33. So right away, we can solve b to be minus 11. So b will equal minus 11. And if b is minus 11, a is 4. A is four. And if a is 4, c is minus 4. So then those all go up on top of those. So we're going to have 4 over x minus 11 over x squared minus 4 over x plus 3 dx. And is there any question on the integration here? First and third are both logs. Absolute value denominator. How do we integrate the middle one? We lift it up, make it x to the minus 2, add 1, divide by the new exponent. So that will give us our final answer. You know, I was really bummed when there wasn't a quotient rule for integration. Hmm, that's substitution. Yeah, but it's not easy. It's Quotient. just not the same. No. It's not the same. It's not as easy. I was hoping there'd be one that was just like, do this and this and this, this and it works for every formula. single one. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing that works for every single one when you're integrating. It's always. Okay, so let's just set this one up, make sure that we observe. This is an irreducible quadratic. So here's where we, we'll use an a, b, plus c. Oh, no, over a, b, a, plus c. A, x, plus b. Or a, z, plus b. Whatever letter you want to use. Wasn't that like oh. a, plus b, x? Switching the letters just for the heck of it is annoying. Yeah. OK, so here we're going to have a over z 
plus b z plus c over z squared plus 16. Mm -hmm. So irreducible quadratic. So an irreducible quadratic is usually a sum of squares, something you can't factor. <clears throat> Multiply both sides by that common denominator. And we will have So this time, let's do a combination. Let's do a convenient value followed by the traditional method. So we'll do it a combination of both ways. What is the convenient value that would be used? Eight. Four. Oh, no. There wouldn't be. 16? If you have negative four, it's still four. 16. Zero. Zero. Because zero here is going to wipe out that whole factor. Right? The convenient values are always the zeros of your factors. And we only have one linear factor, so we only have one that has a convenient value. And that would be zero because that will wipe out that whole thing. What about four i? No i. <laughs> no i. So one equals 16a. So a will be 1 16. OK, so now what we're going to do before we set up our polynomial equal polynomial thing, we'll just plug in that a value. So we're going to come in here. We'll leave this side as z plus 1. a is 1 16, so we're going to end up with 1 16 z squared plus 1 plus b z squared plus c z. And I think that we can probably pull off our coefficients and not rewrite the whole thing in factor. So what is the coefficient of z squared on the right-hand side? So z squared, we're looking here and here. Zero. So zero is on the left. And then on the right, we have 1 16th plus b. So that tells us right away that b is negative 1 16th. My brain does not like fractions like that. <laughs> fractions no good? Not like that, because I'm like, oh, that's 15 sixteenths. No nope. fraction not this right. sad. And what do we notice about z? So the coefficient of z on the left is 1. The coefficient of z on the right is just c, so we're already done with that one. So we have that c is equal to 1. And we have all three letters now. So we have A, we have B, and we have C. I think we might want to go a few more steps on this, because this one does have a little bit of a trickiness to it. So we have, neg we have positive 1 16th over Z. That is not the trickiness. And then we have minus 1 16th Z plus 1, and that's over our irreducible quadratic factor of z squared plus 16. There is our trickiness. Uh, easy. OK. So obviously, the first fraction is no problem. That's just 1 16 times the natural log absolute z. Next. What we're going to do is split the fractions. So we're going to have minus 1 16th z divided by z squared plus 16. And that's going to be an integral there, dz. I'm going to just break it into two separate integrals plus the integral of dz over z squared plus 16. What are we going to do with the middle one? What form is the middle one? The tangent squared. Arctan. Uh, somebody said it. It's log form. Right? Log form? Oh. Uh, right? Because this is a 
quadratic and its derivative is 2z, so we just have to make sure the coefficient matches. Can't also use a trig sum? No. We probably could use a trig sum, yeah. That would be, take a lot more work. Hey, I was technically I'll use this one with physics. Yeah, trig sub could get us there. And this one, we definitely are going to use trig over here, not trig sub, but. Would the answer be the same if we use trig sub, or would it be like. It if it works, it would be the same, yeah. On like a different term? Uh, it might not look identical, but it will be identical right, right, if you right. do some identity. Yeah, I should. I want to try that now. Yeah. Okay, so now we can write down our final answer here. So one sixteenth natural log absolute z minus one over thirty two natural log z squared plus sixteen plus one sixteenth arc tangent of z over four. The derivative of z over 4 is 1 fourth. We multiply by the reciprocal. So the only thing that we see is that that goes into there once and into there four times. And that is our final answer. Unless you want to be log, you want to be log happy. I like problems. Favorite. All right, it is pie o'clock. Not yet. It's pie o'clock? 314. Oh, that one's not. Oh, that's almost, that one only says 313. It just said 312, so it literally just changed. Yeah, huh. it's almost like Because that thing is, should be one of those radio clocks. That thing should be exact. Any uh, last minute questions? So. Are you going to be here like early Tuesday? I will be here early Tuesday. I will be checking email, so if you're working on a problem, you have trouble, just take a picture of it, shoot it off in an email, I'll get back to you. I'm not going out of town this weekend. Say again? Yes, will you send me an email just as a, so I have it on my to-do list? Mr. Voss? Yeah. Um, so